Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh, your integrative OBGYN doctor, speaking to you from my office in Irvine, California. And I am so excited today to begin my series, my Instagram live series on polycystic ovary syndrome, also known as PCOS, the most common endocrine disorder of women but as you're going to find out, it's really an endocrine difference. We are going to reframe how you think about PCOS, particularly if you are one of the millions worldwide, the females who have been diagnosed, or maybe you haven't been diagnosed, because we're gonna talk about that, how often women go from doctor to doctor before they even get the diagnosis. And then when they get the diagnosis, what about the treatments? We are going to go into all of this and so much more on my Instagram Live series on PCOS. Now, to begin with, we must understand what is PCOS and where did it get its really sort of odd name and what does it really mean for a woman to have PCOS. Now you may wonder like, why is this something that I feel so passionate about? Well, I thought I would start just by sharing a bit of my own journey with PCOS. Because for those of you who don't know, this is one of the few times I have felt that sharing my story might help you with your story. Because I am a PCOS lady. I had to self-diagnose and self-treat because the medical establishment, first of all, missed my diagnosis for a very long time and then offered me no solutions to actually healing me, but rather just to try to cover up my symptoms, which for those of you who know about functional medicine, which is what I am a practitioner of, in addition to integrative medicine, it means looking for the root causes of illness and then helping the body to harness the innate mechanisms that we all have to overcome and to heal and to reestablish optimal health, not just cover individual symptoms. And as you're going to learn in this series, the number of symptoms that can be manifested in women with PCOS are quite numerous and quite diverse. And all of this is coming up. But first, my story. When I was a teenager, I got my first period, I was 14, and they were quite irregular. I didn't know what that meant, I just thought, well, maybe that's what happens sometimes. But then, as I got a little bit older, as I got into my late teens, I started developing worse and worse acne. It developed into what we call hormonal acne with the big cysts and it was just so painful physically and emotionally. My mom took me to dermatologists and they gave me, they wanted to give me some topical antibiotics. At that time, a long time ago, there were even fewer therapies than there are today and they were not effective for me. So I tried to figure out my own solutions. I thought, maybe I'm not washing my face enough. It must be that my skin is dirty. I can't see it, but it must be dirty. And there's so much oil. So I started using alcohol and I started taking alcohol, putting it on cotton balls and then swathing all over my face with alcohol. And of course it did just what you think. It dried my skin out. So here I was with these deep cysts and pimples and my skin was so dry elsewhere. It was literally cracking. Well, you can imagine what that felt like in every which way. So when I went off into medical school, I was at USC and I went to one of the most respected, prestigious doctors in the field in my own university setting. And I said, Dr. So-and-so, I don't know what's wrong with me. At that point, I hadn't had a period in two years. I had acne. I was so sad. And by the way, just so you know, I happened to be fortunate in that I was one of what was called, now called, lean PCOS, instead of what nowadays is 80% of women with PCOS have a weight problem with obesity and overweight. But I was actually very thin, much thinner than I am today. And 
So I went to him and he said, you know what, you're not like planning on having any babies soon. Uh, of course, he didn't want me to have any babies soon. I was in medical school. So he said, just go on birth control pills. Like, what's your problem? Women don't even like having their periods anyway. Well, being obedient, I went on birth control pills. They made me feel really sick. I did not like it. I stuck with it for a while. And I kept thinking to myself, like, what is this about? This can't be right. This is not good. I mean, I don't have a period for two years and I go on birth control pills. But it wasn't until later when I was a resident that I put all of the facts together and realized that I had PCOS. And that's when I changed so much about what I did. I was able to get pregnant, but I actually needed fertility treatments for my first pregnancy because I was still working on the process. But then my subsequent ones, they were natural. So I feel for every one of you out there who is suffering and has suffered with PCOS. But here is the bright side. It is treatable. But first, I want you to understand what PCOS is foundationally. As I started from the beginning, it's an endocrine difference. So here's the scoop, not known by very many. We are all unique, different types of people because of differences in our genetics. So you probably know some people are tall, and some people, like me, are short. That doesn't mean that the tall people are better than the short people. We are just different. Some people have brown hair. Some people have blonde. Some people have darker skinned. Some people have very light skins. These are human genetic differences. It's not a question of better or worse. They're just differences. Well, some people, can have different functionality of enzymes. Some people are better at detoxifying than others. Now, some people have what's called the Alzheimer's gene. That's a whole different thing. But in ancient times, the Alzheimer's gene, which is the APOE4, sometimes people think that's really bad. Well, nowadays, it probably is pretty bad. But in ancient times, it was a survival advantage. It turns out people who had APOE4 were more observant of their environment. So they would notice the footprints, the broken branches, and they wouldn't like head into the bear's den and get killed because you're in the bear's den. They would make a quick right turn instead of a left turn because they were observant. Well, women with PCOS are their own unique, different types of people just like that. But just like APOE4, that's not really working out too well today because of the environmental toxicants, the altered food supply, and so forth, that actually takes something that was beneficial and turns it on its head into something negative. And that's what it is with women with PCOS. So women with PCOS, maybe like you and like me, we have a little bit of a different functionality of an enzyme called aromatase that sits in our ovaries. Now, what does this enzyme do? Well, first you need to know how estrogen is made in the ovaries. It starts with the hormone testosterone. Testosterone is made in special cells in the ovary, and they are triggered to be produced by a stimulating hormone that comes from the pituitary gland, which then gets its signals in turn from the hypothalamus of the brain. The hormone that tells the ovaries to make estrogen is called LH, luteinizing hormone. And as we'll go into in the future, many women with PCOS have high levels of this, and I'll get into all of that. So the bottom line is you make testosterone. Testosterone is also one of the final products in healthy, we'll say, typical women. However, most of the testosterone that is made is converted into the estrogen that the ovary primarily makes called estradiol. And how does this happen? Well, the testosterone goes from the initial cells in that area into a different part of the ovary where there are some other different cells. And these cells, the granulosa cells, they have an enzyme that I mentioned 
aromatase. This enzyme converts the testosterone into estradiol, which then goes out and about and does things about the body, but also does things involving the brain that tells the brain what in turn is going on in the ovary, so other signals come out to do something miraculous called ovulation. When one special egg is selected from the follicles that are all lined up, which I'll talk about, to ovulate for the purpose of creating a new life. So what happens in women with PCOS is this enzyme aromatase is a little less efficient. It's not broken, it's not bad, it's just different. It doesn't convert the testosterone as well to estradiol. But does that sound bad? Well, it turns out that in ancient times, that was an advantage. Now, how could that be an advantage? Well, because it was a little bit of natural birth control. It wasn't making women subfertile. It wasn't making them sterile. It just made them a little less fertile. Now, how could that be an advantage? Because if you had too many children, you were more likely to die because childbirth, it's actually kind of dangerous today, you know, because there is still such a thing as maternal mortality. But if you go way back, it was way more dangerous. Women could bleed to death, they could get infections. Having a baby was no small matter. So the more you had babies, the more you were likely that you wouldn't survive it. Plus, those little critters known as our babies, they take a lot of maternal nutrients for themselves. They're a little greedy, but we like them to be greedy, but we need to have enough for ourselves to take care of our own needs and also to supply for the next baby. So what kind of nutrients? Well, like calcium and iron, these are like really big deals. We need these and so does the baby. So we need time to regroup, to re accumulate all of these nutrients. But if you get pregnant really quickly, you don't have that chance. So the baby won't be as optimally healthy and nor will you. So by having a little less ability to make estradiol, you're going to be just a little bit less fertile. That means instead of having maybe eight children, maybe you have four or five. That's okay, that's plenty to reproduce and survive and remember, you only need to make a certain number of kids and have them survive to reproductive maturity to then have them reproduce for the human race to survive and flourish. So we don't need to actually have so many children in order to maintain the population of the human race. So here we have a woman who is healthy, can have children, can have more time with each one, can have time to reaccumulate the the really vital nutrients in her body so that she'll be optimally healthy when she conceives again and have all these wonderful nutrients to give to the next baby. She'll have time with each child to love and nurture and raise them so that they'll be the best people that they can possibly be. That's an advantage. That's what women with PCOS innately have within them. Now, what else do they have? Because they were not as good, not quite as efficient, we'll say, they had that little endocrine difference in terms of producing estradiol, they would accumulate and have a little higher level of testosterone. Not enough to create acne, not enough to grow a beard, not enough to lose your hair and all the really horrific things that women with PCOS must face these days. Just enough extra testosterone to make them bolder, braver, more adventurous, outgoing, dynamic, just a little mini macho in your feminine being. Not enough to make anyone get turned off but to be the leader of the tribe, to be just, you know, the top of the heap of the women of your group. They have shown that women who win Olympic medals actually are this type of PCOS woman. They have the, the issues 
of the ancient PCOS woman without having the manifestation of today's PCOS woman. So I want you to embrace who you are, your beautiful genes that put you at the top of the heap of women in your tribe. But things have changed, things have gone awry for women. And in what way? In a million ways. We now live in a world filled with what are called xenoestrogens or endocrine disruptors, chemicals that disrupt the normal functioning of hormones, particularly estrogen. So I'm gonna talk so much more about estrogen and everyone who's known me or has seen any of my previous webinars and, and seminars and podcasts know that although I love and embrace all hormones, I have my favorite, it's estrogen, because estrogen is the master of metabolic homeostasis. What the heck does that mean? It means it regulates everything in the body that has to do with the production of energy. Well, energy is the spark of life. The difference between being alive and being dead is that alive means you make energy. The difference between feeling great and feeling like crap is having energy. So estrogen in the form of estradiol, the ovarian produced estrogen, is critical for every aspect of maintaining proper energy status in the body. That means it's involved in every single organ and every single function. Whenever I'm not sure and I learn of something new, you know, some new um, signaling agent or whatnot, I go to my PubMed sources and I look it up and invariably I learn the connection it has to estradiol. There is nothing that I have ever heard about in the body that doesn't have a connection to estradiol. So what has gone wrong is that we live in a world filled with chemicals that interfere with estrogen, estradiol signaling. Now this could be how it's produced, how it's distributed, the receptor function, its degradation, its elimination. All of these things can go wrong in the presence of endocrine disruptors. Now, if you have exposure to an endocrine disruptor at key times during your development, how about like when you're a fetus, when your endocrine receptors are just in the developmental stage, what can happen? Plenty and it's not good. If your receptors for a hormone are not receiving, then the signal does not get delivered to the cell. So think about this. You send a package that's so important to a house, and when it gets there, the postman, and we have postmen who still are working, and they knock on the door, they say, package, package here, but nobody opens the door. Message delivered, message not received. That's what can happen in women with PCOS. They've now done studies showing that higher amounts of BPA, bisphenol A, one of the ubiquitous, that means it's everywhere, chemical endocrine disruptors that we all have in us to some degree, that women with PCOS have more of it. They may not be quite as good at getting rid of it. After all, we did not evolve to have plastic in our bodies because that's what it's from. It's a petroleum product, it's a plastic, and it's like in can, can liners, it's in cash register receipts, it's in all the hard plastic that is in everything, in everything. So this BPA is everywhere. And women with PCOS, if they are exposed and they have the genetic issues that I mentioned with the enzyme aromatase, then we are in trouble because remember, Innately, they make estrogen a little bit less than other women, which is not a problem in the absence of all these other problems that come into play. So if you have a situation where your estrogen receptors are suboptimal in their functioning, the estrogen that you have, which is a little bit less, is going to be even less in terms of its actual function because less of it is going to actually create the signal to the cell because the receptor is not opening the door and letting that package in. So that is what is happening with women with PCOS. 
This was now shown in studies that the estrogen receptors in women with PCOS are simply not as functional. Now, it gets even worse because we have this issue with too much testosterone and it turns out that estrogen is key to the function of the GI tract. So this was hypothesized by my dear friend, Professor Kelton Tremellen in Adelaide, Australia back in 2012. But his hypothesis was only proven very recently in like the last three years by researchers. Initially, the group came out of China and they showed what his hypothesis was, which is that the environment of the gut is altered in a negative way in women with PCOS. They have an altered gut microbiome. That's the microbial life forms that live in our gut. There's trillions of microbes in there. And what happens is they are altered for the worse. And this is because estrogen is key to maintaining the integrity of the gut barrier. When it's lost, they call that leaky gut. And when you don't have the right microbes in and you have this altered environment, the microbial population creates toxins called endotoxins, also known as LPS lipopolysaccharides. These toxins then pass through the gut lining, which is impaired, the leaky gut, into the immune system that surrounds the gut called the GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, where all these immune cells are residing. 70 plus percent of the immune system of the entire body lines the gut. That's how important it is. Now, back in 1998, another friend of mine, a researcher at one of the universities in Indiana, discovered that women with PCOS, their immune cells are hypersensitive to stimuli. That means that they explode with their inflammatory contents and create an inflammatory response at a lower level, at a lower trigger. Well, now you have immune cells in the lining of the gut ready to do their job, which is to create an inflammatory response to warn the body to fight off an invader like a bacteria, a virus, because they're there to protect us. But now you have these toxins that are produced by the wrong bacteria coming into this area, and these immune cells are exploding with their inflammatory cytokines because it doesn't take much and they go, wow, inflammation galore. This inflammation circulates throughout the body and it, what does that do? It triggers more insulin resistance, which is so common in women with PCOS, so they are more prone to prediabetes and diabetes. And when you have higher amounts of insulin, insulin, which is necessary for survival, also promotes fat development, production, and storage, hence you now have higher sugar, you have more fat, you have more weight. When you have BPA, it also interferes with mitochondria and also less estrogen, which are also critical for mitochondria. These are the energy producing organelles of cells. So women with PCOS are less capable of burning fat and creating energy. On top of that, the elevated levels of insulin increase the production of another hormone that has binding sites on the ovary called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. And here's a really big important thing for you to know, IGF-1 triggers an increased production of testosterone. Now, the brain also says, hey guys, where's my estrogen? The ovary is producing not enough estrogen. So the brain in turn puts out more signal to the pituitary, which then puts out more signal to the ovary, which is, as I mentioned, LH, luteinizing hormone. So the ovary now is making more testosterone because the brain says, give me more estrogen, but you have more malfunction. Now the aromatase enzyme, which I mentioned, produces less estrogen in healthy prehistoric women with PCOS. Now, because of the endocrine disruptors, it turns out that there is less capability than there even was originally. There's less of another hormone coming from the 
pituitary called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is needed to trigger the action of aromatase. So you can see how complicated this gets. But what you end up with is aromatase, that key enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol is less functional now. You have more LH triggering more testosterone. You have more insulin triggering more IGF-1, which goes to the ovary, which triggers even more testosterone. And then high levels of testosterone have in have their own mechanistic problems in the body that change the dynamics of things for the worse as well. So this may seem hopeless, but it is not. I want you to understand, and I am not going to give you a test or a quiz, so you can go back and listen to this anytime you want. It's gonna be posted on YouTube. I know it's complex. And that's one of the most important things to take away. PCOS is in nature going back to prehistoric times, not really that complex. You had this minor decrease in the functionality of aromatase, that's all it was. So you were a little less fertile, not a lot. You had a little more testosterone, but not a lot. Just enough to make you even better as a woman. You know, the best of all worlds. But now, with all of this complexity, with endocrine disruptors and I didn't even get into it, but I will later, that part of the problem with the gut, it's not just estrogen being deficient, it's also crappy food being in excess. So when you eat the wrong food, you don't nurture your gut microbiome and you may even poison it with chemicals. So you have the perfect storm coming together to alter the gut microbiome, to then create this chronic state of inflammation systemically, which drives up insulin, inflammation drives up insulin resistance, drives up IGF-1, drives up more testosterone. The brain is not getting enough estrogen. It puts out more signals, more LH from the pituitary. You can't produce more estrogen because the aromatase enzyme is even more incapacitated than its normal slight change, that endocrine difference. But in the upcoming shows, I am going to tell you a lot of my secrets so that you, as a PCOS woman, can really have the best life possible. But if you don't want to wait for all of my shows and you want to have way more detail, then buy my books. I have this one. This is my first book, by the way, all written with my amazing daughter, Alexis. I couldn't do it without her. She should have her picture on the cover, I swear to you. So this is my first book, hundreds and hundreds of references, PCOS SOS. And you know what the underlying subtitle? A Gynecologist Lifeline to Naturally Restore Your Rhythms, Hormones, and Happiness. I hope you will get this. Now, here's the gift. This book and my other, I'm going to just show you in a moment, 99 cents all of September for the Kindle version on Amazon. 99 cents for the Kindle version. And here is my second book on PCOS, PCOS SOS Fertility Fast Track. For those of you who want a baby and pronto, this book is a week by week, easy, detailed guide on how to optimize your fertility and in the process, of course, be really healthy so that you can have a healthy baby and an uncomplicated pregnancy. So that's the subtitle, the 12-week plan to optimize your chances of a successful pregnancy and a healthy baby. We don't want you to just get pregnant. That's not the only goal. It's to have a healthy baby and be a healthy mom. So here are my two books again on both of them, only 99 cents, all of September on Amazon. Now, if you enjoy my books, please be kind and leave a nice review. If you like my Instagram, please also be kind and give me a like. It's only through you because I am not a social media giant. I'm a practicing doctor here to help you in any way I can. If you can come to see me in my office in Irvine, California, I'm very happy to see you. I see patients from all over the world 
that fly out even during coronavirus pandemic. If you can't do that, I do telemedicine and I'm very happy to work with you and also with your existing doctors. I'm a team player, but I'm here to make a difference. That's my mission. I suffered and I don't want any of you to suffer. I have a pathway that will work. We can help you to optimize your health. So that's the conclusion of my first episode on Instagram Live on PCOS. PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder of women. You know someone with it or you have it yourself. September is PCOS Awareness Month. This is the month when we take time to really think about PCOS and help and care about those who have it. So until next time, stay well. I look forward to hearing your comments and I will be here in any way I can to help you. So take care, stay safe, bye.